Hi, this is Seth Leishman with World History by a Jew. After my first Mesopotamian math, part one, I'm now back for Mesopotamian math, part two. Uh, make sure you see the first part before you watch this. It was uh, a video from November of 2018. Okay, so Mesopotamian math, part two. Let's talk a little bit more um, practical about how they used math back in ancient Mesopotamia. So. Math for them was to solve real-world problems. So you didn't have these complicated exercises uh, with chalkboards full of calculations. For them, math was about make, about say business transactions or accounting and this sort of thing. Uh, so why? Well, let's say if you've got land parceled up, so it's for calculating land parcels and making sure everyone has the amount they're supposed to. Uh, the length of a canal. So if you're building a canal. Uh, the calculations related to that, like the number of man hours to build the canal. And then let's talk about farming, right? How many bushels uh, of a given crop that's being produced. The amount of time, so whether you're building a canal or uh, the crops or so forth, the amount of time you need to put into it. Or maybe just dealing with, say, missing quantities where you know part of the, the story but not the rest of the story, so you need to calculate the missing quantity. So these are all real world problems. And this also leads to a, a very obvious difference between their math and ours is they didn't really use negatives so much because you don't need negatives in any of these applications. Uh, so let's talk about some more differences between the systems. Uh, so this is uh, our system, which is the modern system, versus uh, the Mesopotamian system. So writing Mesopotamian numbers, uh, let's talk about the positional notation. So their positional notation was actually better than the Romans that came long after them, right? Where you have the, the I's and the V's and the X's and so forth. They did use positional notation, which is closer to what we're used to, although it is a different type of notation. So we, of course, use a base 10. So by base 10, say we have 1 plus 10 plus 100 plus 1,000. So each of those steps in the position, if you add all those up, you get 1,111. Uh, now let's talk about with a base 60 system. You have 1, next position 60, next position 3600, next position is 3600 times 60, which is 216,000. Total of those up and you get 219,661. So you see there is a positional difference, but nonetheless you can tell by position uh, at, at what level you're dealing with in the calculation. Now let's talk about kind of a, a weakness to their system, at least I'll call it a weakness in our minds, that is they did not have a zero. Uh, and so they would either leave a gap, so especially in later times they left a gap to signify a, a zero or a nothingness, uh, and, but in earlier times you may not even have that. Uh, so like 30, let's take the number 36, and cuneiform would be written the same as 306, which would be written the same as 3006. And you just have to know what, what you're dealing with based on context. Uh, so this was, the zero system that we use was not really fixed until the Arabs brought us the Indian system in 700 or so of the common era. Um, so, and by the way, I, I should say that what made zero so popular in Europe, since I am uh, the lecturer of World History by a Jew, I'll say that it was a rabbi, Rabbi uh, Abraham ben Ezra's system. Uh, he brought it. He had wrote a book called Sefer HaMispar in 1146. Sefer HaMispar just means the the book of number, and, and he really is what with this book made zero the way we use it today uh, in practice throughout Europe. Let's go. Let's move to another weakness. Uh, again, this is weakness by my definition. Maybe someone from ancient Mesopotamia wouldn't call it a weakness, but let's talk about decimals, for example. Uh, Decimals uh, can cause a similar confusion in their system. So they use kind of this, what we would call a floating point system. A mathematician would call it a floating point system. I don't know if the common man would call it that. Uh, but let's just say, similar to I was show, showing you how you had to know where the zero was, uh, the decimal is the same way. So if you had zero, let's say you take 0 0.0036 would be written the same as 0 0.036. That'd be written the same as 0.36, and that'd be written the same as 3.6, or even to 36. So you really have to know again in context where your your decimal place would be. Uh, so like even and keep going, 360 is the same as 3600, which is the same as 36,000. 
So this is this, this floating point. Uh, you also would have to know the, the context. And, and by the way, anyone who knows how to tol tell time, uh, this helps. So think, pretend you're looking at a clock face and this makes a little bit more sense. But five and a half, we'll say, written in base 10 would be five and then space 30 in, in, this, in, in base 60. So and remember, when I say five space 30, this 30 is really 30 over 60. So we have five and a half, which is five space 30. And if you want it more in a context, know that 30 is really divided by 60. So, so another, give me another example. Let's say two and a fourth. So two and a fourth in base 10. Now we're going to convert to the base 60. That would be two space 15. And again, it's like 15 over 60. That's your one fourth. Uh, seven and three fourths. So seven and then space 45. So again, seven, and then it's like having 45 over 60. We're, we're thinking like we're looking at a clock. Um, so decimals could be a little bit confusing. You definitely had to know your context. Division was also very different for them, whereas uh, Mesopotamians had a clear addition and they had a clear subtraction and they had a clear multiplication. They did not have this fourth category of division, at least the way we think about it. Uh, so there was no long division function. Instead, if they're dealing with division, they'd really use multiplication with a reciprocal. Uh, I don't want to get too complicated here, but let's say you've got 2 divided into 10. Uh, so what they would actually do is take that 2 and flip it around for the reciprocal. So the reciprocal of 2 is 1 half, right? It's 1 over 2. So 1 over 2, which is 1 half times 10, equals 5. So by flipping around to use this reciprocal, you get the same thing, right? So 10 divided by 2 equals 5. Or if you take the reciprocal and say 10 times 1 half, you also equal 5. So it still works. It's just it's more like just a modification of multiplication instead of having a separate division category. Now, uh, these reciprocals can get really complicated. I intentionally chose an easy one since, this, since I'm just filming a quick video on this. Uh, but they, there have been tons of tables found of reciprocals. So, uh, you know, the reciprocal of, uh, uh, and not only that, but just, just remember that it's always out of 60. So if you've got the reciprocal uh, of, uh, of 3 over, uh, of the reciprocal of 3, right? So, so you and I would be thinking, oh, well, that's uh, 0.333. But to them, it's really 0 0.20 because it's, it's over 60, right? So... Uh, four, if you got the reciprocal, you and I are, are thinking 0.25, but to them it's really 15 because it's 15 out of 60. This goes back to my first video uh, where you really have to know the sexagesimal system. Uh, reciprocals in practice were probably most commonly used for calculating interest, right? Uh, they, they did have interest like we have now, uh, and you would need the reciprocals for doing these smaller percentages to figure out how much to add. Uh, now, getting back to this this these tables. So we have these very complicated numbers and there were and we just found tables upon tables in cuneiform. So all these tablets you just see like tables for reciprocals, tables for multiplication, tables for fractions, tables for square roots, tables for conversions, uh, and much much more. So basically you had all these tablets that were cheat sheets. So we'll call them, you can't call them cheat sheets because they weren't sheets of paper, we'll call them tattle tablets. So just imagine you have all the, the, if you were a mathematician back then, you have all these tattle tablets to help you with the various calculations. Now, the, uh, let, let's talk about how you use those tablets in practice. Now, um, obviously, if it, if it just gives you the straight answer, well, that, that's easy. But um, let's, let's say you're dealing with uh, numbers in between. Like, uh, obviously, 1 6 is easy. That would be on your tablet. But what if you're dealing with 1 7th? What if you're dealing with 1 11th? What if you're dealing with 1 13th? So if you take 1 7th, this is like an infinite sexagesimal fraction. Like you're just not going to have the ending of what 1 7th is. So to the Mesopotamians, it was okay to use estimates. In fact, they would actually solve a problem. If they, they realized that the decimal would go on forever, they would just solve the problem by saying, okay, uh, here's the answer. And by the way, this is an approximation, like literally they have like the sentence, this is an approximation. So uh, by doing this, they're kind of covering themselves. And if you think about it, uh, they're not sending men to the moon. Uh, maybe the ancient aliens people will tell you they were. I think that they were not. Uh, and if you're not sending men to the moon, 
then uh, it's okay using estimates for, say, like a few acres of land uh, or a, a few bushels. Uh, it's okay. You don't need to go round to the decimal to the nearest uh, thousandth. Um, now, let's talk about the most famous decimal place, and that is pi, right? So I don't think you can have an estimate more famous than us when we calculate pi. The Mesopotamians, let, let's, well, let's talk about pi, for example. Pi is simply the fixed ratio of a circumference of a circle to the diameter of that circle. So in other words, you know, the, from go, so, so you're going to take the diameter of the circle, uh, and you know there's relationship to the circumference of the circle. And, and the Mesopotamians knew that it was about 3 to 1. It seems in earlier days they really did calculate it probably exactly 3 to 1. Uh, in later times, it was more like 3 and a quarter, so 3.125 in our terms, which is not so bad uh, to compared to what we now calculate as 3.14 and blah, blah, blah. So, so 3.14... Uh, versus 3.125 for their calculations would be good. And how they would represent it, of course, they didn't use the Greek character pi, but to them it was basically a fraction of 25 over 8. So if you look at 25 over 8, that's going to get you your, um, your, your 3 and a quarter. Now, the, uh, and, and by the way, they, they knew the calculations, right? So a circumference of a circle would be what we call 2 pi r. They'd use the same formula. An area of circle is pi r squared. They use the same type formula. Again, these are not scientific measurements, these are land parcels, so this was a, a workable estimation of reality for them. Now, let's, let's talk about, uh, in terms of calculating area, they, had, they were dealing with land parcels mostly when they're calculating this area, and parcels, land parcels were owned by the king, uh, they were leased by the king, they were owned by the temple, you had systems of serfdom, uh, you had businessmen, you had big landowners, uh, you had uh, plantations, to use modern terminology. So parceling out land for all these various different categories was very important, and determining the, uh, the space was, uh, was vital to their business model. And, and they calculated area just like we did, length times width, right? So if you had a rectangle, many, four kilometers long and three kilometers wide, you would just multiply those to get 12 kilometers uh, and, and so they had a similar system. Now, they did have more, cal more complicated formulas. You, it's like, say you had a trapezoid. Well, they knew how to deal with the trapezoid. So if they're looking at a trapezoid, they would just say, let's, they would take the, the, the average of the, the two different sides versus the one single side. So, so to give you calculations, let's say it's uh, six cubits uh, wide on on side on one side and it's four cubits on one side and two cubits on the other and the side that's six cubits was the same on both then you take the average so the two cubits times the four cubits that average is three cubits so six cubits times that average number three cubits gives you 18 cubits for the area this would be very simple for them did this all the time and, and by the way they did even more complicated ones where you say you have to have a circle connected to a trapezoid Again, they would know how to use the two different, use pi for getting the one portion, and then using this length times width calculation with averages to get the other. Uh, very simple stuff for them. Now, let's talk about the Pythagorean theorem because they had to deal with triangles a lot too. So they were well versed in dealing with the calculations related to uh, right angles. And this is where basically, our, well, first of all, I know you're all thinking Pythagorean, that was Greek. Well, um, yeah, so. Pythagoras lived around uh, 500-ish uh, BCE. Now, we're talking about Babylonian tablets that go back 1,000, maybe even 1,400, 1,500 years before he lived. So obviously, he was not the originator of the concept of dealing with the right angle. But, the, but in their terminology, the Mesopotamians were well-versed of this A squared plus B squared equals C squared concept that we all learned in algebra. And, uh, and so this was already, this knowledge was well over a thousand years old when Pythagorea, with the Pythagoreans supposedly discovered it. Um, so we knew that the Mesopotamians were, were well versed with dealing with right angles, they're well, well versed with dealing with pi, and then finally they also were well versed with algebra. So you can probably see from my, from my previous example, we're getting closer to algebra. So 
that they did have their own quadratic formula. The quadratic formula you should all remember from school is, uh, is where you have the ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. And then based on that, you get your quadratic formula for solving for x. And they had both, the, they had the quadratic formula. They did have their own square root method. In fact, they were very advanced in the square root calculation. So they could solve for this uh, issue. And, and this would be like, when would you use this? This would be like, okay, well, I, I'm calculating a building where I know, one, maybe it's like by a river or something. I'm calculating a building where I know one side needs to be two times the other. Uh, you would see this being used. If I'm dealing with profit models, like for a business enterprise, you, it helps to have algebra. If you're talking about a, the speed of a, different shipping boats down a river, it helps to have algebra. So in conclusion, the Babylonians were excellent mathematicians but in terms, in practical terms, they, uh, they already were using math that the Greeks supposedly discovered a thousand plus years later, and they knew how to use math in the most real terms that we can all still appreciate today.